There we are. Well, a warm welcome to our third Sunday in Advent worship service on uh, this cold and drafty and drich Sunday morning. Uh, we have, for those on, on YouTube, we have a, a, a gathering of folk in church. You'll hear their voices as we say the words of liturgy together. My name is Neil Robbie, this is Holy Trinity Church Online, and we are um, using a service sheet which you'll find on the internet. It looks like this, and the theme is The Perfect Promise. In Mark, 11, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 8, verse 11, which we, which we read a couple of weeks ago, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus... To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given it. Well, today we're focusing on the sign that God gave to Israel, to Judah. And so we'll start with our opening words. If you would like to stand, please do, and we'll focus on the sign. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. O come, O come, Lord Jesus, let the light shine in the world. Save us from our sin. That's sit or kneel. As we pray, we're going to see how the Pharisees had asked for a sign, and we're going to see that the sign itself is Jesus. The Pharisees were not willing to accept that, wanted more. We're going to find how John the Baptist prepares the way and how Isaiah prophesied. But we're going to pray now the third collect, uh, the collect for third Sunday in Advent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, who at your first coming sent your messenger John the Baptist to prepare the way for you. Grant that the ministers and stewards of your truth may be so ready to make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming to judge the world we may be found acceptable people in your sight. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, One God, now and forever. Amen. We'll light the candle for third Sunday in Advent. Only one Sunday to go. In Luke... Chapter 1, Zechariah sings a song, <clears throat> excuse me, and that, and that song is about his son John, John the Baptist. And so let me just read to you four verses from Luke chapter 1, and verses six, 76 to 79. And Zechariah rejoices at the birth of John the Baptist. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. John the Baptist prepared the way for the birth of Jesus, who is the shining sun from heaven, who shines light into our darkness, who came for salvation of his people, the salvation of his people, by the forgiveness of sins. And so as God's people aware of our need for forgiveness, we're going to spend time now just confessing those sins to God, asking him for forgiveness, and then receiving knowledge of forgiveness through Jesus. So let's 
Let's gather our hearts. And pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. We declare God's forgiveness together. O people, put your hope in the Lord. His love endures forever. He is called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We can't sing, but we can have music. And we're going to, to um, watch a, a, a song that I think we already know. It's called Matthew's Begats. If you look at Matthew's Gospel, the first 18 verses, there's a list of 42 generations of people from Abraham to Joseph. Those 42 generations were waiting and waiting and waiting for the birth of the Saviour. So can you imagine how, how long that was to wait? Not just within one generation, but 42 generations. It's now been around 40, 42 generations since the birth of Christ, since his re resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven. And we are still a waiting people. We are waiting and waiting for the Lord's return to judge the world and save his people and restore his creation. So let's take a moment just before the song sings to think about how long the people of God had to wait. 42 generations. And how it feels for us to wait today for the Lord's return. And then we'll play Matthew's Begats. So we're going to think about signs. I'm going to turn my microphone back on. We're going to think about signs. We saw how the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign. He said none would be given to it, but he himself is the sign. What was he, what was he a sign for? Well, on your, on your table, I hope you've got a, a, a set of road signs. 
We're going to split these into two groups. Um, so the first group will be warning signs. Which ones of these are warning signs? And which one are action signs? Things that we should do. So um, maybe you want to just write under each sign. Warning sign or action sign. How did you get on? Did anyone, anyone spot a pattern in the signs? Oh, I'm off again. There we go. Sorry. Did anyone spot a pattern in the signs? Um, which one's the warning signs? Which one's the action signs? So, so i just give the answers. It's kind of hard with masks on. Um, the, the, the second row with the traffic lights, the zigzag in the road and the deer are all warning signs. So the triangles are warning signs. Humps for half a mile, warning sign. And uh, no footway for 400 yards, warning sign. The circles are action signs. Drive slow than 40. No entry and bikes and cars. Prohibited, is that? Yes, prohibited. And then the give way action signs. Stop and give way at the top are kind of mixed up signs because um, they are both warnings and action uh, and they're different shape. So that's the idea of signs being both warnings and actions. We're going to see in our passage that the sign that is promised is both a warning and an action sign. So as you read, uh, read Isaiah now, let's be looking for the answers to these three questions. Who was the prophet? What was the sign? And what did the sign mean for Israel? Uh, Israel's the northern kingdom of, um, at this point, because this kingdom of, that was Israel's broken into kingdom in the north, which is Israel, the kingdom of the south, which is Judah. What did the sign mean for Israel? And what does it mean for us today? So should we read Isaiah 7 after I've prayed? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the God who gives us signs, and those signs are both warnings and action signs, instructing us to do something. And we pray, as we read your word now, that you would help us to see the signs, understand the warnings, and do the actions. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 7. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the, house, the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool, on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of those 
two smouldering stubs of firewood because of the fierce anger of Rezin and and Aram and of the son of Ramaliah. Aram, Ephraim and Ramaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabiel king over it. Yet, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it will not take place, it will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. It is not enough to try, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son will call him Emmanuel, and he'll be, he'll, eat, he'll be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, for before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring upon you and your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring you the king of Assyria. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Great. Well, we might associate with the people of Judah who were trembling and disheartened. And we want to hear those words. Verse 4. Be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. So, What was happening at the time of Ahaz, the king of Judah? You've got the the sheet that says the perfect promise at the top. There's a map on there. And this will help us to understand the politics of that generation. I've also got these figures who you might have thought were the wise men who were bringing their gifts to Jesus. But it's not. These are the figures who represent the characters in this part of the history of Israel and of Judah. So, what was happening at the time of Ahaz, king of Judah? Well, you can see Judah on the map, and here is Ahaz, king of the southern kingdom, which is Judah. And then we've got the uh, Rezin, who's the king from the kingdom of Aram, which is now Syria. So where is is resin? Okay, I'll show the camera. Look, this one this one represents King Ahaz, and here's King Resin. Now, King Resin joins forces with who? Um, Pekka who's the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. So, here's the surprise. Half of God's people join with the enemy of God's people to fight the other half of God's people. That's slightly shocking, isn't it? Who's the prophet? Isaiah, God's spokesman, who's speaking to King Ahaz. So, which two kings joined together? Rezin of Aram and Pekah of Israel, half of God's people, to fight against the other half of God's people. Now, Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz. Here's a question. Why does God get angry with Ahaz? God's on the side of Ahaz at this point. 
Why does God get angry? Look at verse 11 and 12. Ask the Lord for a sign, whether the deepest depths, the highest height, but Ahaz said, I will not ask. So why was, why was God angry? Ahaz was deliberately rebellious, deliberately disobedient to God. So, here's a question. Why do you think Ahaz would not listen to God? I'm not sure there's anything in the passage that would tell us why he wouldn't listen. Maybe he just doesn't, doesn't trust God. Maybe he just doesn't think God can deliver him like he said he would. Verse 7, God said, this will not take place. These two guys here are going to crumble. They're not going to do what they threaten to do. So, Ahaz has heard God's word, been told to ask for a sign, and has refused to obey. And I'm going to turn back to 2 Kings chapter 16, which gives a bit of commentary on what then Ahaz does at this time to show what Ahaz was trusting to save him. In, in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 5 to 9, Rezin, king of Aram, this fella, Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, marched up uh, uh, to fight against Jerusalem and besieged Ahaz. So that's what happened. They came to fight. At that time, Rezin, king of Aram, recovered Elath for Aram by driving out the people of Judah. So he's conquered most of the kingdom. He's not got to Jerusalem yet. Edomites then moved into the Elath to have uh, and have lived there to this day. Well, Ahaz sent a message to another guy called Tiglath Pelisar, king of Assyria. This is this fella. So Ahaz asked the big guy with all the big armies to come down. He said, come and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and the king of Israel who are attacking me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold from the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace and sent it as a gift to the king of Assyria. So he bought protection from this powerful king. The king of Assyria complied by attacking Damascus. So if you look on the map, Assyria is in the very top right. So whilst Rezin's down fighting with, with Pekah down in Jerusalem, the Assyrians come in from behind and attack Damascus. The king of Assyria attacked Damascus, captured it, and deported all its inhabitants to Kir and put Rezin to death. So Rezin is now dead. And that was this guy, Ahaz, the plan he had to try and save himself without God's help. So, at this time it looks like Ahaz's plan has worked. Turns out later it doesn't work. That shouldn't surprise us. Who should, God have, who should Ahaz have trusted? The answer is obvious, isn't it? Trust God. God has said he's going to deliver you from the hands of, of Aram and Israel. So here's a question for us. Are there times that we find it hard to trust God's promises? Times when there's a threat. Times when it feels shaky. And we are facing powerful enemies of some kind. Times you find it hard to trust God's promises. And 
Who or what are you tempted to trust instead? I wonder if there's a very immediate application of this is where is our heartfelt trust at this time? Are we heart, heartfelt trust in the Lord's promises through Jesus Christ? Are we trusting what he has said he will do? Or have we transferred our trust to the government or to scientists or to vaccines? You know, is our trust and hope in them? Or above all that, are we trusting in the promises of Christ? I wonder if at any times that you're tempted to disobey God so you can be friends with the popular people, maybe at school or at work or important people, to try and get yourself into a position of power, or even with powerful people. That's what Ahaz did, wasn't it? He, he, he was tempted to disobey God and instead make himself popular by using the silver and gold from the temple and from the storehouses of, the Israel, of Judah to buy influence in the world. One of those times you felt threatened and instead of trusting God, have tried to make up your own plan or strategy, get myself out of this situation by doing this, this and this. So God, in all of that situation, calls us to look for the sign that he's given us. So we've thought at the beginning of the service how the Pharisees asked for a sign, and Jesus said, I won't give you one, but how God said the sign himself would be a child, a son. So, even though, even though Ahaz disobeyed God, God gave Ahaz a sign anyway. Therefore the Lord himself, verse 14, will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. will call him Emmanuel. That means God with us. The creator God of the universe comes to live with us. And there'll be a warning with the sign. The warning is that Ephraim, that's that's the northern kingdom of Israel will collapse and also the, the king of Assyria will collapse and the sun will reign. So uh, verse 16, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. There's the warning to those nations and then the king of Assyria will be laid waste too. All the kingdoms, all the powerful kingdoms of the earth will be laid waste. And one kingdom will remain, the kingdom of the sun, the sign from heaven. So, today, we all need to, we all need to know is that God gave a sign of a son who would reign. He would be called Emmanuel, God with us. He'd be more powerful than all the nations on the earth. His kingdom would last forever and ever and ever. All the kingdoms would be destroyed. That's the warning. And so therefore the action we need to take is to say, which kingdom am I in? And shall I transfer myself from the kingdoms of the earth to the powerful kingdom of the Son of God? And knowing that Christ came as the sign from God of the destruction of the kingdoms of the earth and his establishment of his own kingdom, how does he change the way that we react in difficult and dangerous situations? We say, Christ, your kingdom will endure forever. You are the sign that God is with us. Therefore, we can trust you. And therefore, as our reading said, we can be careful to keep calm and not be afraid and not lose heart 
because of the two smouldering stubs of firewood, Ephraim and Aram, or whatever the enemies are that we face. And we see in this passage that God's heart is not primarily for judgment. His justice needs to be satisfied, and he will judge sin, but his heart is for the mercy that he wants to show to his people that he's come in the person of the Son, Emmanuel, in order that we might know mercy in times of trouble. Shall we pray as we receive God's word? Father God, we can see the foolishness of Ahaz in disobeying your word. And we know that disobedience in our own life. And we know the warnings that you sent against the kingdoms of the earth, which seek to rule against you. Lord, that those kingdoms are destined for destruction. And so we pray that you'd help us to be confident of being in your everlasting kingdom. As the Virgin gave birth to a son and is called, who's called Emmanuel, Jesus, this Christmas may we know that you are with us, that your heart is for our forgiveness to show your mercy. We pray you'd help us to trust you more this year, even in hard times. And we pray that we would, we would receive the help that you send us and not try to strategize our own escapes. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just pray. Carry on praying together. Lord, we pray for the church in this world. Lord, we pray at a time when there seems to be a, a lack of good leadership we pray that church leaders in this nation would take every opportunity to share both the warnings and the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins at the cross, his resurrection from the dead, our eternal hope of his kingdom enduring forever. We pray when our society only wants to hear all sorts of laws and morality and, and vague thoughts about love. We pray for the clarity of the gospel to break through. We pray that this whole nation would sing your praise this Christmas. We pray for ourselves, the Holy Trinity, to be a church that knows the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus, the hope of his resurrection from the dead, and that, Lord, we live this out throughout the week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the world, we pray for a swift return of the students kidnapped from their boarding school in Katsina State in northern Nigeria. Lord, we pray for the whole of the northern Nigerian church. Lord, where there is so much fear of attack, either from Boko Haram or from the tribesmen. We pray, Lord, that the northern Nigerian church, the Christians in that place, would not lose heart they would not fear. They'd find great comfort in knowing Jesus that every kingdom which opposes you will one day be destroyed. We pray for continuing Brexit negotiations for the politicians and civil servants in the UK and Europe. Lord, we pray for businesses as they prepare for a no-deal Brexit. Lord, that whatever happens in the next few weeks and in the years that follow, we pray that you would help us here to continue trusting you and serving one another. And we pray for our community. We pray for our own MP, Nicola Richards. We pray that she might come to understand and believe the truth. We pray that she would be able to make wise decisions following your counsel as you are the head of all things exalted above the earth. That from you flow all power and majesty and authority. We pray for the decisions that the council makes for this town. And they too would submit to your authority and seek to do good according to your will. 
We pray for our neighbours who are poor or hungry or struggling in life. Please, Lord, may they turn to this church for help. May we know the people who are in need. And may we pr- please bless especially the work of the West Bromwich Food Bank and Keith Turner as he leads it. We pray for the sick. We ask for, our, for healing and comfort for all who suffer. We pray, Lord, for all who would know the strength that you give in the depth, the depth of the riches of your grace and your peace and your mercy and your love. And so, Lord, we bring before you everyone we know at this time who needs that comfort and healing. In a moment of quiet, we name them in our hearts. Lord, at this time of increased death in our nation, we pray for all who mourn. Lord, we pray that as Zechariah sang, they would know as they walk in the darkness of the valley of death that a light from on high has shone and that, Jesus, you bring hope into the darkness of our world. We pray that you would, they would know that you are the God who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. To the glory of your name. Amen. Let's continue to pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We've got another song on the screen, and um, it'll begin with a familiar verse. It's O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We sang it last two Sundays. This is a slightly different version, so I encourage you just to, to let the words speak to you as, you as you hear something that may not be familiar, but it's, it's a, great, a great version. Oh, sorry, it's not O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I've, it's the Christmas song. It's a new song. It takes us to the heart of Christmas. As this world celebrates Christmas without the birthday boy, without Christ, Um, Let's be those who make Christmas Christ-centered. And and the line in this song is this, um, the newborn baby in the hay, and that's what Christmas is all about. Let's, uh, Let's listen to this.
hadn't spotted until we watched again that line, there is no need to be afraid for those who trust in Jesus' name. And, and that's a lesson that we've learned from Ahaz today. There is no need to be afraid as Christ shows his compassion for the lost as he comes in great mercy to save sinners from that warning of judgment and into the glory of, of the kingdom of the son he loves. What a great message. I'll, I'll put that as a, a 20 schemes song. And we saw one last week of theirs, uh, 20 schemes of ministry in Scotland and seeking to plant churches in some of the most deprived communities in Scotland. And that's their music ministry. And I'll put that, I'll put that song on the Facebook channel uh, or on the YouTube channel if you want to find it for later. And do share with your friends. Let's make the Christmas all about Jesus this year. Before we pronounce God's blessing, let me take you through some notices. There's some important notices about Christmas coming up. Um, you'll have remembered from last week that um, we've just jumped on the back of BBC local radio stations with the doorstep carols. Um, I've been out around the neighbours around here, and I know that Helen's going to do the Mary Road, and we just want to encourage people to come out from their houses. There was a good response, about half people I spoke to were keen to come out. So I've, made a, I've printed 40 of these um, words, words sheets. If you have arranged with your neighbours to go and sing on your doorstep on Wednesday at 6 o'clock, then do take copies if you need them. If you have, haven't arranged to, to meet with your neighbours, uh, you are welcome to come down here. You can stand on the pavements or in the church grounds, and, um, and hopefully the, there'll be enough radios out on the streets to allow us, allow us to hear the tunes. It is a new thing. It started in Shrewsbury two years ago. Hopefully it will build momentum and become a regular thing at Christmas. Um, as we pray for the weather, if the weather's like this tonight, or the weather's like this on Wednesday night, I don't think anyone will come on the doorsteps. Let's pray it's dry. It can be cold as long as it's dry. Let's pray for that. So that's the first message. The second message is... Oh, I was just going to say, if you want to get copies of this yourself, you can download them from the internet by following the link on the back page of the order service to doorstepcarols.co.uk. The next message is about Chris... Oh, I've managed to pull the notices out of my folder. Here we go. Christmas Day service with a discussion of PCC. We're going to have our first communion since lockdown on Christmas Day, a really special day to meet for communion. And so, considering all the advice on COVID security, we decided the best <clears throat> way to go is for people to bring their own glass and plate, probably in an airtight bag, uh, if you have one, and I'll, I'll distribute the bread and the wine onto the, uh, into that glass, onto that plate. And that's the, we agreed to the PCC, that's the safest way we can do it. Um, we're, we're not sure what will happen beyond Christmas, but let's try and make Christmas very special in that way. Um, the service on the 27th of December will be online. Uh, the, church will be, the church buildings will be closed for the two days after Christmas. We still have Advent Daily Prayer on YouTube, and you might have noticed um, also from Helen's videos for the, for the All Age, um, the, 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 the line that last song that Jesus would come to crush the serpent's head we've been thinking about that in our daily readings uh, if you haven't been following it's not too late to catch up uh, do join the daily prayer and the daily Bible readings on the, on, the face, uh, on the church website and YouTube channel small group Bible studies continue this week um, we'll be talking in those groups about what we'll do over Christmas and cake and chats on this week too if you want invitations to those, please let me know and let Amanda know or Helen. No, Helen's uh, the small group on Wednesdays now finished. And that, I think, are our notices for Christmas. Uh, there's one more which is here. Um, if you're aware of anybody who hasn't got a Christmas lunch, um, would you consider sharing some of your lunch with them? And if you, if you, if you know of anybody else and you can't do it, um, we, we're going to do that as a, um, from the vicarage. Just let us know and we'll, we'll deliver a Christmas lunch to anybody who hasn't got one. Great. 
Let's pray our final blessing. Shall we stand for this and pronounce God's blessing on each other? Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Every blessing.